Book Five, Chapter One, of A Hero of Our Time, by Mikhail Yurovich Lermontov, translated by Mar Murray and J. H. Wisdom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Book Five, the third extract from Pechorin's diary, Princess Mary, Chapter One, Eleventh May. Yesterday I arrived at Pyatyagorsk. I have engaged lodgings at the extreme end of the town, the highest point at the foot of Mount Mashuk. During a storm the clouds will descend on to the roof of my dwelling. This morning, at five o'clock, when I opened my window, the room was filled with the fragrance of the flowers growing in the modest little front garden. Branches of bloom-laden bird cherry trees peep in at my window, and now and again the breeze bestrews my writing table with their white petals. The view which meets my gaze on three sides is wonderful. Westward towers five peaked Bestau, blue as the last cloud of a dispersed storm, and northward rises Mashuk, like a shaggy Persian cap shutting in the whole of that quarter of the horizon. Eastward the outlook is more cheery. Down below are displayed the varied hues of the brand-new, spotlessly clean little town with its murmuring, health-giving springs and its babbling, many-tongued throng. Yonder, further away, the mountains tower in an amphitheater, even bluer and mistier, and at the edge of the horizon stretches the silver chain of snow-clad summits, beginning with Kazbek and ending with two-peaked Elbrus. Blithe is life in such a land. A feeling akin to rapture is diffused through all my veins. The air is pure and fresh, like the kiss of a child. The sun is bright, the sky is blue. What more could one possibly wish for? What need, in such a place as this, of passions, desires, regrets? However, it is time to be stirring. I will go to the Elizaveta Spring. I am told that the whole society of the watering-place assembles there in the morning. Descending into the middle of the town, I walked along the boulevard, on which I met a few melancholy groups slowly ascending the mountain. These, for the most part, were the families of landed gentry from the steppes, as could be guessed at once from the threadbare, old-fashioned frock-coats of the husbands and the exquisite attire of the wives and daughters. Evidently, they already had all the young men of the watering-place at their fingers' ends, because they looked at me with a tender curiosity. The Petersburg cut of my coat misled them, but they soon recognized the military epaulets and turned away with indignation. The wives of the local authorities, the hostesses, so to speak, of the waters, were more graciously inclined. They carry lorgnettes, and they pay less attention to a uniform. They have grown accustomed in the Caucasus to meeting a fervid heart beneath a numbered button and a cultured intellect beneath a white forage cap. These ladies are very charming, and long continue to be charming. Each year their adorers are exchanged for new ones, and in that very fact, it may be, lies the secret of their unwearying amiability. Ascending by the narrow path to the Elizaveta Spring, I overtook a crowd of officials and military men, who, as I subsequently learned, compose a class apart amongst those who place their hopes in the medicinal waters. They drink, but not water, take a few walks, indulge in only mild flirtations, gamble, and complain of boredom. They are dandies. In letting their wicker-sheltered tumblers down into the well of sulphurous water, they assume academical poses. The officials wear bright blue cravats. The military men have ruffs sticking out above their collars. They affect a profound contempt for provincial ladies and sigh for the aristocratic drawing-rooms of the capitals to which they are not admitted. 
here is the well at last. Upon the small square adjoining it, a little house with a red roof over the bath is erected, and somewhat further on there is a gallery in which the people walk when it rains. Some wounded officers were sitting, pale and melancholy, on a bench, with their crutches drawn up. A few ladies, their tumbler of water finished, were walking with rapid steps to and fro about the square. There were two or three pretty faces among them. Beneath the avenues of the vines in which the slopes of Mashuk is covered, occasional glimpses could be caught of the grey-coloured hat of a lover of solitude or two, for beside that hat I always noticed either a military forage cap or the ugly round hat of a civilian. Upon the steep cliff where the pavilion called the Aeolian Harp, is erected, figured the lovers of scenery, directing their telescopes upon El Bruz. Amongst them were a couple of tutors, with their pupils, who had come to be cured of scrofula. Out of breath I came to a standstill at the edge of the mountain, and leaning against the corner of a little house, I began to examine the picturesque surroundings, when suddenly I heard behind me a familiar voice. Pietorin, have you been here long? I turned around. Gruznitsky. We embraced. I had made his acquaintance in the active service detachment. He had been wounded in the foot by a bullet and had come to the waters a week or so before me. Gruznitsky is a cadet. He has only been a year in the service. From a kind of foppery peculiar to himself, he wears the thick cloak of a common soldier. He has also the soldier's cross of St. George, he is well-built, swarthy, and black-haired. To look at him, you might say he was a man of twenty-five, although he is scarcely twenty-one. He tosses his head when he speaks, and keeps continually twirling his moustache with his left hand, his right hand being occupied with the crutch on which he leans. He speaks rapidly and affectedly. He is one of those people who have a high-sounding phrase ready for every occasion in life, who remain untouched by simple beauty, and who drape themselves majestically in extraordinary sentiments, exalted passions, and exceptional sufferings. To produce an effect is their delight. They have an almost insensate fondness for romantic provincial ladies, when old age approaches, they become either peaceful landed gentry or drunkards, sometimes both. Frequently they have many good qualities, but they have not a grain of poetry in their composition. Grushnitsky's passion was declamation. He would deluge you with words so soon as the conversation went beyond the sphere of ordinary ideas. I have never been able to dispute with him. He neither answers your questions nor listens to you. So soon as you stop, he begins a lengthy tirade, which has the appearance of being in some sort connected with what you have been saying, but which is, in fact, only a continuation of his own harangue. He is witty enough. His epigrams are frequently amusing, but never malicious, nor to the point. He slays nobody with a single word. He has no knowledge of men and of their foibles, because all his life he has been interested in nobody but himself. His aim is to make himself the hero of a novel. He has so often endeavored to convince others that he is a being created not for this world, and doomed to certain mysterious sufferings, that he is almost convinced himself that such he is in reality. Hence the pride with which he wears his thick soldier's coat. I have seen through him. And he dislikes me for that reason. Although to outward appearance we are on the friendliest of terms, Grusnitsky is looked upon as a man of distinguished courage. I have seen him in action. He waves his saber, shouts, and hurls himself forward with his eyes shut. That is not what I should call Russian courage. I reciprocate Grusnitsky's dislike. I feel that some time or other we shall come into collision upon a narrow road, and that one of us will fare badly. 
His arrival in the Caucasus is also the result of his romantic fanaticism. I am convinced that on the eve of his departure from his paternal village, he said with an air of gloom to some pretty neighbor that he was going away, not so much for the simple purpose of serving in the army as of seeking death, because, and hereupon I am sure he covered his eyes with his hand and continued thus, No, you or thou must not know, your pure soul would shudder, and what would be the good? What am I to you? Can you understand me? And so on. He has himself told me that the motive which induced him to enter the K regiment must remain an everlasting secret between him and heaven. However, in moments when he casts aside the tragic mantle, Grushnitsky is charming and entertaining enough. I am always interested to see him with women. It is then that he puts forth his finest efforts, I think. We met like a couple of old friends. I began to question him about the personages of note and as to the sort of life which was led at the waters. It is rather a prosaic life, he said with a sigh. Those who drink the waters in the morning are inert, like all invalids, and those who drink the wines in the evening are unendurable, like all healthy people. There are ladies who entertain, but there is no great amusement to be obtained from them. They play whist. They dress badly and speak French dreadfully. The only Moscow people here this year are Princess Ligovsky and her daughter, but I am not acquainted with them. My soldier's cloak is like a seal of renunciation. The sympathy which it arouses is as painful as charity. At that moment two ladies walked past us in the direction of the well, one elderly, the other youthful and slender. I could not obtain a good view of their faces on account of their hats, but they were dressed in accordance with the strictest rules of the best taste. Nothing superfluous. The second lady was wearing a high-necked dress of pearl gray, and a light silk handkerchief was wound around her supple neck. Puce-colored boots clasped her slim little ankle so charmingly that even those uninitiated into the mysteries of beauty would infallibly have sighed, if only from wonder. There was something maidenly in her easy but aristocratic gait, something eluding definition yet intelligible to the glance. As she walked past us, an indefinable perfume, like that which sometimes breathes from the note of a charming woman, was wafted from her. Look, said Gruznitsky, there is Princess Stigovsky and her daughter Mary, as she calls her after the English manner. They have been here only three days. You already know her name, though. Yes, I heard it by chance, he answered with a blush. I confess I do not desire to make their acquaintance. These haughty aristocrats look upon us army men just as they would upon savages. What care they if there is an intellect beneath a numbered forage cap and a heart beneath a thick cloak? Poor cloak, I said with a laugh, but who is the gentleman who is just going up to them and handing them a tumbler so officiously? Oh, that is Rayevich, the Moscow dandy. He is a gambler. You can see as much at once from the immense gold chain coiling across his sky-blue waistcoat. And what a thick cane he has, just like Robinson Crusoe's, and so is his beard, too, and his hair is done like a peasant's. You are embittered against the whole human race? And I have cause to be. Oh, really? At that moment the ladies left the well and came up to where we were. Gruznitsky succeeded in assuming a dramatic pose with the aid of his crutch, and in a loud tone of voice answered me in French, Mon cher, je hais les hommes, who ne pas le mépriser, car autrement la vie serait une face trop dégoûtante. The pretty Princess Mary turned round and favored the orator with a long and curious glance. Her expression was quite indefinite, but it was not 
contemptuous, a fact on which I inwardly congratulated Grusnitsky from my heart. She is an extremely pretty girl, I said. She has such velvet eyes. Yes, velvet is the word. I should advise you to appropriate the expression when speaking of her eyes. The lower and upper lashes are so long that the sunbeams are not reflected in her pupils. I love those eyes without a glitter. They are so soft that they appear to caress you. However, her eyes seem to be her only good feature. Tell me, are her teeth white? That is most important. It is a pity that she did not smile at that high-sounding phrase of yours. You are speaking of a pretty woman just as you might of an English horse, said Gruznitsky indignantly. Mon cher, I answered, trying to mimic his tone. Je me pris les femmes pour les parler, mais car autrement la vie serait un mélodrome trop ridicule. I turned and left him. For half an hour or so I walked about the avenues of the vines, the limestone cliffs and the bushes hanging between them. The day grew hot, and I hurried homewards. Passing the sulphur spring, I stopped at the covered gallery in order to regain my breath under its shade, and by doing so I was afforded the opportunity of witnessing a rather interesting scene. This is the position in which the dramatis personae were disposed. Princess Ligovsky and the Moscow dandy were sitting on a bench in the covered gallery, apparently engaged in serious conversation. Princess Mary, who had doubtless by this time finished her last tumbler, was walking pensively to and fro by the well. Gruznitsky was standing by the well itself, and there was nobody else on the square. I went up closer and concealed myself behind a corner of the gallery. At that moment Gruznitsky let his tumbler fall on the sand, and made strenuous efforts to stoop in order to pick it up. But his injured foot prevented him. Poor fellow! How he tried all kinds of artifices, as he leaned on his crutch, and all in vain! His expressive countenance was, in fact, a picture of suffering. Princess Mary saw the whole scene better than I. Lighter than a bird, she sprang towards him, stooped, picked up the tumbler, and handed it to him with a gesture full of ineffable charm. Then she blushed furiously, glanced round at the gallery, and having assured herself that her mother apparently had not seen anything, immediately regained her composure. By the time Grusnitsky had opened his mouth to thank her, she was a long way off. A moment after she came out of the gallery with her mother and the dandy, but in passing by Gruznitsky she assumed a most decorous and serious air. She did not even turn around, she did not even observe the passionate gaze which he kept fixed upon her for a long time until she had descended the mountain and was hidden behind the lime trees of the boulevard. Presently I caught glimpses of her hat as she walked along the street. She hurried through the gate of one of the best houses in Pyatyagorsk. Her mother walked behind her and bowed adieu to Royevich at the gate. It was only then that the poor passionate cadet noticed my presence. "'Did you see?' he said, pressing my hand vigorously. "'She is an angel, simply an angel.' "'Why?' I inquired with an air of purest simplicity. "'Did you not see, then?' "'No.' I saw her picking up your tumbler. If there had been an attendant there, he would have done the same thing, and quicker, too, in the hope of receiving a tip. It is quite easy, however, to understand that she pitied you. You made such a terrible grimace when you walked on the wounded foot. And can it be that, seeing her as you did, at that moment, when her soul was shining in her eyes, you were not in the least affected? No, I was lying. But I wanted to exasperate him. I have an innate passion for contradiction. My whole life has been nothing but a series of melancholy and vain contradictions of heart or reason. The presence of an enthusiast chills me with a twelfth night cold, and I believe that constant association with a person of a flaccid and phlegmatic temperament would have turned me into an impassioned visionary. 
I confess, too, that an unpleasant but familiar sensation was coursing lightly through my heart at that moment. It was envy. I say it envy boldly, because I am accustomed to acknowledge everything to myself. It would be hard to find a young man who, if his idle fancy had been attracted by a pretty woman, and he had suddenly found her openly singling out before his eyes another man equally unknown to her, it would be hard, I say, to find such a young man, living, of course, in the great world and accustomed to indulge his self-love, who would not have been unpleasantly taken aback in such a case. In silent, Gruznitsky and I descended the mountain and walked along the boulevard, past the windows of the house where our beauty had hidden herself. She was sitting by the window, Gruznitsky, plucking me by the arm, cast upon her one of those gloomily tender glances which have so little effect upon women. I directed my lorgnette at her, and observed that she smiled at his glance, and that my insolent lorgnette made her downright angry. And how, indeed, should a Caucasian military man presume to direct his eyeglasses at a princess from Moscow? End of Book 5, Chapter 1 Reading by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com